Okay, why don't we slowly get started as people come in, uh, they'll be let in. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we are recording, so don't uh, feel any pressure to take any notes or anything. Uh, you'll be able to revisit uh, everything uh, that's covered. Um, I'll also make sure you have my contact information. Uh, I'll give my email at the end. Uh, also, you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, both with an evaluation um, and also with my contact information, uh, just to make sure that if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer anything um, that maybe you don't think of during the Q&A today. Um, but just as we get started, uh, my name is Mark Lipschatz. I am one of the clinical associates, the, one of the therapists at the center. Um, I see individuals and couples and facilitate a few support groups. Uh, chemo brain happens to be one of my uh, uh, personal and uh, professional interests. Um, so I've done uh, some research compiling um, just some of the mechanisms as well as uh, some specific tools and interventions for chemo brain. Um, I know most of you, because you're here, you're at least somewhat familiar with Cancer Wellness Center. Uh, if you don't know too much about the center, uh, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we serve anyone that's impacted by a cancer diagnosis, whether that be um, the person diagnosed, a family member, loved one, um, or bereaved. Uh, we have clinical services, both individual, couples, family, and group counseling, as well as wellness programming, such as yoga classes and various other um, various other activities. Um, so you can always go out to our website, cancerwellness.org, to see. Um, any programs uh, or services that you might be interested in. And again, you'll have my contact information and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, why don't we get started? Um, at any point, you please send a message in the chat if you have a question. Um, and uh, Lisa uh, from Cancer Wellness Center, who's helping moderate today, um, because uh, no one can unmute just yet. Lisa, if someone sends a question in the chat, uh, feel free to uh, interrupt and I'd be happy to answer it as we go. Otherwise, we'll have uh, plenty of Q&A time uh, towards the end. Uh, but let me just move this aside. Okay. Um, well, just to give a little bit of an overview of what today might look like, uh, we'll we'll get started uh, with uh, an overview of chemo brain itself, uh, some definitions, some uh, just some brief in introduction to it. Uh, we'll discuss ways um, of optimizing the nervous system. We'll discuss the feedback loop of chemo brain. This will all make sense in just a few minutes. Uh, the bulk of the presentation will be about uh, interventions to chemo brain. Um, and then again, we'll finish with some Q&A, happy to answer all of your questions, um, both specific to uh, your situation uh, or uh, anything else that might come up. Um, so we all know the endless um, list of chemo side effects. Um, the ones that people frequently think of are, are hair loss, constipation, uh, anemia, uh, uh, diarrhea, weight changes, right? The list goes on and on. Um, but not until relatively recently have cognitive effects been researched. Uh, memory problems and attention and concentration problems are frequently reported uh, uh, side effects of chemotherapy as well. Um, so chemo brain, as we'll discuss today, is the experience of new problems with memory, concentration, learning ability, um, and processing speed associated with chemotherapy. Uh, depending on the study, between 20 and 75% of individuals receiving chemotherapy experience chemo brain. Um, this is a pretty big range, 20 to 75%. Um, and the reason for this is uh, depending on the study, they define, uh, the researchers define uh, what chemo brain is maybe a little bit differently. They include different presentations or different symptoms in their definition. So that's what leads to this big, this big range. Uh, but with relative confidence, we can say at least one in five people may experience chemo brain. Um, the cognitive effects tend to be mild to moderate, um, but persistent. Um, but fortunately, most individuals improve within a year to a year and a half um, after their last chemo treatment, um, but approximately 20% experience long-term effects. 
Um, but the good news, though, is that it's not progressive. So, for example, if an individual happens to be within that 20 percent um, that it do experience chemo brain long term, uh, cognitive impairment is not progressively getting worse and worse throughout that time. Uh, so it does plateau. Um, so I want to show you these uh, scans. Um, here you can see two sets of fMRI scans um, taken of a set of identical twins. Um, in psychology research, having identical twins as participants, um, it's for a study is like winning the lottery. That's the gold mine. Um, and so this is because you're able to better discern if what is happening, what what the observations of researchers are making, um, if it's happening due to genetic reasons or if it's due to environmental reasons. Um, in this case, uh, that would mean uh, cancer diagnosis and chemotherapy. So MRIs, um, as some of you may know, magnetic resonance imaging, um, lets you see structure of a specific bone or organ. Uh, but fMRIs, functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, lets you see the activation of different brain regions by tracking blood flow. Um, so in this set of scans, uh, the top row is twin A, um, and the bottom row is twin B. Twin A has a breast cancer diagnosis and has undergone uh, a, a protocol of chemotherapy. Twin B does not have breast cancer and did not receive chemotherapy. Um, so in this study, uh, the twins were asked to complete a task that tests working memory function, and we'll discuss exactly what that means in just a second. Uh, but as you can see here um, in these scans, um, though the twins were performing the same exact task, uh, twin A, the twin who has received chemotherapy, has much greater activation and strain than her sister. It's important to note for our reasons, um, you know, for our purposes here, uh, that both twins successfully completed the task, though it was much more cognitively demanding for twin A. And we'll talk about that, why, about why that's important later on. Um, so I want to go over just a handful of definitions of different terms that um, I'll use today just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Again, no need to memorize this, no need to take notes. You'll have the recording. You can always revisit this. Uh, so concentration uh, is the ability to absorb and process information um, uh, in general, right? So for this, you're either concentrating or you're not. It's like an on-off switch, uh, so to speak. Um, a, Attention uh, is the ability to apply focus on an item. So for this, it's like a spotlight that you can direct. Um, so concentration is um, an on and off switch, and then attention is the spotlight that you're directing um, to what you're paying attention to. Um, Short-term memory is what helps us recall things that we just heard, saw, or read within the past few minutes. Uh, so for example, um, you know, if I were to ask, were the twins in the previous slide identical or fraternal? that would be a test of short-term memory. Uh, the answer is identical. Um, long-term memory is the ability to recall things from a long time ago, uh, as the name implies, uh, which means 30 minutes to years. Uh, so examples of this would include what you ate for breakfast this morning or you know who your childhood best friend was. Working memory um, is what allows us to hold information in our minds so we can use it to perform an act. Uh, so this would be like going into another room to get something or hearing a phone number and writing it down. Uh, working memory, as I mentioned, is what is the task that um, the twins in the previous slide were asked to complete. Uh, memory consolidation um, is a structural neuronal change leading to recently learned experiences being transferred into long-term memory. Um, it could be really uh, interesting for some scary to think about that memories um, is really neuronal changes. Uh, whenever you learn something, neurons are forming um, and connecting in our minds. And this is the, you know, the neuronal uh, level of, of a memory. So I, I want to introduce the idea of optimal arousal. Uh, and this is a big idea uh, sur uh, surrounding, you know, the topic of chemo brain. Um, this can also be thought of as mental stimulation or stress. Um, and stress has a negative connotation, but in this case, um, it can be anything. So um, as it turns out, um, uh, stimulation, uh, stress, uh, and optimal arousal is um, extremely important for memory consolidation and performance. 
Cortisol, which is the stress hormone, is released by the adrenal glands in response to stress. Uh, cortisol reduces inflammation, increases sugar, uh, glucose, as you may have heard um, it referred to in the bloodstream, and shuts down any non-essential bodily functions that are not needed in emergencies. The hippocampus, which is the memory center of the brain, and the prefrontal cortex, which controls attention, um, have many receptors for cortisol. Uh, this means that they are particularly sensitive to the effects of cortisol. Um, in addition to that, cortisol diverts blood flow and inhibits glucose uh, sugar utilization in the hippocampus, um, which means it has less access to that energy. Um, so as you can tell uh, clearly, uh, the stress response um, is, um, is almost synonymous with, um, with what many people describe as chemo brain symptoms. And we'll talk about this. Uh, so this chart that you can see here shows a relationship between arousal and memory performance. Um, as you can see, too little arousal leads to too poor performance. So um, an example of this is if you imagine just waking up from, from a long, deep nap and somebody asks you, you know, where did you put your keys when you got home yesterday? Um, chances are your answer won't be that accurate. Or if anything, you'll um, it'll be harder to... Uh, it'll take longer to respond. Um, similarly, though, uh, too much arousal and your cognitive performance will be negatively impacted as well. Um, so what this might look like is, you know, if you imagine sirens and fire alarms are going off all around you, you're in the grocery store, um, you know, you probably wouldn't be able to recall what your PIN number is, you know, when you put in your debit card as easily uh, or perhaps as accurately. Um, you know, similarly, if uh, you know, there's sirens, loud noises, lots of distractions, um, and you're in a state of uh, too high of arousal right now during this presentation, you probably wouldn't be able to retain, you know, some of this information as well. Uh, so the sweet spot is right in the middle uh, where you have enough stimulation to keep your hip hippocampus and prefrontal cortex functioning, uh, but not too much where it overwhelms your system. Um, for those that may have uh, a clinical or a psychology background, this might look familiar. Uh, this is called the yerkes dodson curve, um, something very interesting to, to look into if this is something you find interesting. Um, so uh, both internal and external processes, uh, interestingly, uh, can impact the amount of arousal and stress that, uh, that your body experiences. So as I mentioned, a stressful environment, uh, whether it's uh, loud, crowded, uh, overwhelming, um, that can contribute to the uh, too high of arousal. Um, anxious, if you're feeling anxious about, uh, about a doctor's appointment, for example, uh, that could lead to the stress response. Um, so inevitably, you won't retain as much information. I'm sure many of you can recall a time that you may have spent a long time with a doctor and you leave and you barely remember anything the doctor even said. Um, and also the anxiety and stress regarding the memory problems themselves, um, which I want to talk about right here. So I want to walk you through the feedback loop uh, that individuals with chemo brain frequently experience. Um, so first, chemo brain leads you to having difficulty with cognitive tasks. Uh, these tasks can be remembering where you put your keys when you got home, uh, when your appointment is, finding a specific word that you're trying to think of, uh, or, you know, remembering what someone said a few minutes ago. Um, this uh, difficulty creates um, a subjective perception of a disparity between cognitive demands and cognitive abilities. So in other words, there becomes a gap between what is expected of your memory and attention uh, and et cetera, and your current cognitive abilities. This frequently leads to a distress response. Uh, so something like, uh, let me know uh, just by uh, uh, nodding or show of hands if this sounds familiar. This is so frustrating. I hate when this happens. Um, I will never have the memory I had before chemo. This is so embarrassing, things of this nature. Um, these responses uh, signal cortisol to be released. Uh, which further exacerbates chemo brain. Um, so it's through this cycle uh, that cognitive impairments are continuously um, being amplified and prolonged. 
Um, another way of summarizing this is that the cycle of chemo brain itself induces a distress response. Um, and through the high arousal state that this triggers, uh, it leads to additional chemo brain difficulties. Um, and so really, this is just a, a self-propagating feedback loop. So I want to show you a list of frequently reported attention and memory problems uh, that are reported by uh, cancer survivors. Um, I won't read the whole thing, uh, but just some examples are recalling names or remembering names or the faces of people you recently met, uh, following what people are saying, staying alert to what's going on, and so forth. Um, now, I want to show you a list of common things people without cancer forget. Um, again, some examples are forgetting telephone numbers, forgetting where the car is parked, forgetting appointment dates, uh, forgetting the content of daily conversations. So the point of comparing these two lists, um, I want to be clear, is not to say that, you know, your cancer memory problems are uh, just like everyone else's. So, you know, no need to even worry about it. Um, but rather, you know, these two lists demonstrate that not all memory and attention problems in daily life are due only to cancer. Um, normal forgetting is a basic executive functioning of the brain that helps itself organize and reorganize um, what's important to remember and what's not. Um, some of you may have heard of a condition called hyperthymesia. Uh, there's an interesting uh, 60 minutes on this uh, that covers it, but um, it's a condition where an individual remembers everything, everything that they've ever experienced. Um, many people with this condition um, actually report experiences of, you know, profound suffering. Uh, you know, they're burdened by every single memory they've ever experienced. Um, you know, this helps illustrate the necessity of natural forgetting. Uh, but in addition to natural forgetting, um, short and long-term memory performance tends to worsen with, with age due to the changes in biochemistry and uh, patterns of blood flow to the brain. Uh, so in fact, your age at the time of receiving chem chemotherapy is actually a predictive factor of the severity of which you may experience chemo brain. Um, I wanted to also, you know, go over these two lists, um, you know, just to touch on how the excessive stress response that comes up when facing memory problems uh, can exacerbate chemo brain. Uh, so by understanding how other factors such as normal forgetting, um, age, stress, hunger, fatigue, um, how these can all contribute to memory problems, this can help start, um, you know, the focus, uh, shift the focus, excuse me, um, on things that we can, uh, that we can change. Um, and we'll do that right now. Um, Lisa, uh, can you let me know if any questions have come in so far? I can try to pull up the chat. Um, I'm not seeing any right now. So uh, feel free to continue um, setting them in. Um, otherwise, um, we'll, we can unmute at the end uh, with any questions. Uh, so now I wanna talk about the actual interventions. You know, How can you have an impact on uh, your chemo brain symptoms? Uh, so the first intervention I want to talk about is self-monitoring. Um, I can't stress enough how important context is. Um, something uh, I tell to my individual clients when I work with them is context, context, context. Uh, so by recording the context in which a certain event occurs, um, there can be a lot of meaningful data uh, that can be derived just by reflecting on all of the contributing and surrounding factors. Uh, so some examples are the time of day, level of distress, uh, what was happening around you, how you were feeling right before and during the event, um, and so on. Um, so what happened? When did this happen? Uh, and what happened right before? These are all important questions to be asking yourself um, as you think about what could it be contributing to, um, to a certain event or a time when you are experiencing memory or attention difficulties. Um, so some additional examples of contextual fa factors, uh, to consider are, you know, tiredness, hunger, the lighting, some people find it, you know, when it's really bright, you're distracted, or when it's really dark, it's hard to focus, um, the time of day, uh, that can dictate, um, you know, based on your energy levels, 
um, emotion, uh, based on how you're feeling. Are you anxious? Are you overwhelmed? Um, stress, uh, as I mentioned as well. Um, and when enough recordings are completed, patterns and themes can be reflected on and, uh, you know, change can be made accordingly. So if you notice that hunger is a common theme, for example, you know, maybe an idea is to pack some extra snacks, you know, in your purse or to keep in your car. Um, is If stress is a common problem, uh, then re relaxation techniques will, will be a good resource. And we'll talk about one uh, here in a second. Um, so essentially, you know, what I'm trying to say here is um, you have the ability to adapt to your experience and to mold it into one that improves your quality of life. Um, I forgot to take this part out. Usually I send it out to everyone. Not everyone, uh, you know, uh, wants this. So you'll have my email address. Um, I do have a form, uh, a template that helps with, uh, you know, the self-monitoring. So if you're interested in that, feel free, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'll gladly um, get you that template. So the next intervention that I want to discuss is self-instruction. So we talked about self-monitoring. This is self-instruction. Um, in self-instruction, uh, the goal is to re reorient yourself uh, and focus on a task in order to not let internal processes interfere, uh, that internal dialogue. So for example, when trying to remember something and um, the right word can't come to mind, um, you know, just like that example I shared earlier, uh, this might sound familiar. Um, someone might say, you know, oh, shoot, you know, my chemo brain is so bad. I'm never going to remember things. This is so frustrating. Um, you know, this can be distracting and validating, um, and it can shut down the whole process of trying to achieve your goal. Um, instead, the self-instruction is a way to talk yourself through the task. Um, so I'll demonstrate here just with this example um, you know, it's a, a simple demographics form uh, that I quickly put together. I'm sure this is uh, this is a lot more simplistic than any form you might see at a doctor's office, but just an example um, of something that you you might find yourself completing. Um, so, okay, all right. what what is it I have to do? Okay, I'm going to fill out this form. Okay, let me see first, I'll fill out my name. Mark, okay, M-A-R-K. Okay, good, now my date of birth. Um, okay, make sure I have the right year. Okay, yes, I do. Now I move down to my address. Okay, my address is 215 Revere Drive. Uh, whoops, I put lane. Okay, that's okay. I'll just erase it and mix it and, and fix it to drive. Um, okay, um, I'm distracted by a noise, but that's okay. I'm refocusing now. Let's fill out phone numbers. So, you know, notice the difference between I'm distracted by some background noise, but that's okay. Um, I'm refocusing now. Um, the difference between that and, you know, I always forget the zip code. This is so embarrassing. I'll never have the mind I had before chemotherapy. You know, the goal is to matter of factly, but, you know, gently guide the focus back to the task at hand. Um, the best effects will come from talking to yourself like this during most daily tasks. Uh, and it's it, it can take some practice, but, you know, that practice is helpful. Um, you know, a, a good phrase is practice with the mundane as well as the meaningful. So, you know, that is use self-instruction in virtually all tasks, such as tying your shoes, getting keys out of your pocket to, you know, unlock a door, uh, sorting and folding laundry, cleaning and organizing clutter, you know, all of these daily tasks. Um, even if the task itself seem, might seem trivial, um, it can be a good opportunity to, you know, hone, to hone your self-instruction skills. Um, again, the goal here is for self-instruction to become automatic uh, and in good form when the pressure is on to, you know, perform well and actually complete the form, for example, uh, in important non-trivial tasks. Uh, this is just an example of a form. Feel free to use this, um, you know, to practice uh, or again, just everyday daily tasks. Um, all of it can be good to practice with. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, re relaxation techniques um, are really are a really good way to find that optimal arousal if you notice that um, you're towards that higher end in any given moment. Um, so progressive muscle relaxation, or PMR, as I'll refer to it, 
um, is an exercise where you lay flat on a mat, a couch, a bed, a uh, recliner, um, or uh, you could be sitting in a chair as well. Um, and you slowly flex and relax a series of muscle groups um, as guided by a recording. Um, the reason for flexing is because muscles actually relax more after they've been slightly flexed. Um, a good metaphor that I like to use for this is um, if you imagine how comfortable, you know, that couch in your living room is um, after a long day, in this case, flexing, um, compared to how comfortable the couch seems, you know, first thing in the morning. Um, you know, I'm sure the, the couch seems comfortable in both scenarios, um, but we all know just how much more comforting, you know, it is after a long day or in our case, after a few seconds of flexing. Um, when doing this exercise, uh, you know, please listen to your body. Do not flex or strain, um, you know, to a point where it hurts. Um, if you can't flex a certain muscle group um, um, because of pain or mobility issues, um, you can just focus on the group, direct some attention uh, to that part of your body and relax during that part. Um, PMR helps build the skill of self-regulating arousal. So if you think back to that upside down U graph, the yerkes dodson curve that I shared earlier, um, PMR helps you take control of your own arousal state um, instead of um, you know, hoping that the high arousal state will eventually decrease on its own. Um, you do have that control. You don't, you know, you don't have to just sit, sit by crossing your fingers, hoping it passes, but there's a way that you can intervene in that process. Um, reducing arousal helps improve attention, uh, which leads to improved learning of information for future recall. Um, so remember that the stress response diverts blood flow and, and sugar utilization, uh, in the hippocampus, which is the memory center and prefrontal cortex, uh, which is uh, which controls attention. The sympathetic nervous system is a part of your nervous system that helps you fight and run in case of emergencies. Uh, but on the other hand, the parasympathetic nervous system helps you recover, relax, um, and helps you restore your energy levels. Um, you know, you can think of this as skydiving. Sympathetic nervous system is the exhilarating, uh, screaming part of the dive, um, uh, but the parasympathetic nervous system helps slow things down, um, just like a parachute. Um, and it helps to remember parasympathetic parachute. Um, the, the sympathetic nervous system um, is quick and powerful, uh, but it can't last forever. Um, PMR serves to balance and counteract the nervous system's response to stress. Um, so uh, in the vagus nerve, uh, which controls a lot of our stress response, uh, neurons between the body and the brain are 80% towards the brain and 20% in the direction of your body. Um, and again, this is specifically in the vagus nerve. Um, so what, what this means is that your brain is constantly taking in cues from your bodily sensations. Uh, so if your muscles are tight and flexed, your sympathetic nervous system interprets this as a cause for being on edge, activated, and in a state of stress and being on high alert. Um, but by relaxing, you know, unneeded muscles, uh, this helps balance the system and tell your brain that it's, that you're safe and that you can be regulated and that it's safe to do so. Uh, so again, uh, this is something that you can uh, very easily look up uh, on, on YouTube, uh, progressive muscle relaxation. You'll find thousands upon thousands of videos. Um, I encourage you to find one of a duration that works for you. Um, uh, some have music, some don't, uh, but also find one, you know, where, um, you know, where the video has a, a voice that, that you're okay with. You know, if, if the, the narrator, you know, the voice sounds like your old boss you didn't like, uh, don't try to force yourself, you know, you won't be able to relax if, you're, if you keep thinking about that. So find, you know, a video that, that works for you. Um, another idea is rehearsal and chunking. Um, so in, for rehearsal, um, I'll put up these first couple ones. Um, there's overt rehearsal and there's covert rehearsal. So in overt rehearsal, this is repeating out loud. So an example of this is, you know, if I was at a meeting or out at, uh, out at a party, let's say, um, and uh, I met someone, uh, this might sound like, you know, hi, nice to meet you, Jane. Jane, 
Nice to meet you. I'm Mark. Um, looking the other person in the eye helps, you know, um, at forming a, a name face association. And again, the more variables, the more factors that you have associated with the person, the more likely you are that some connection uh, will stick. Um, covert rehearsal, um, on the other hand, is repeating to oneself silently. Uh, so uh, to yourself, you know, the lady over there is named Jane uh, after after meeting them. Um, I will say between overt and covert rehearsal, overt is more effective, but again, both are better than no rehearsal at all. Um, there's also spaced rehearsal, um, and this is uh, making the time interval gradually longer between repetitions. Um, so again, I'm gonna stick with <laughs> with Jane. Um, I might say, you know, hi Jane, nice to meet you. And then to myself, um, whether that be just quietly to myself or in my mind, uh, quite literally tell myself, Jane, um, okay, Jane, uh, Jane. And then a little bit later with more time, okay, over there, that's Jane. Um, then as I'm getting into my car to drive home, I might, you know, reflect back on the, on the that meeting, that party, that lunch, whatever it was, uh, and ask myself, you know, who did I meet at lunch? Oh, that's right. Her name was Jane. Um, so again, the spaced rehearsal is what solidifies that memory, um, for that retention. Um, it also, um, space rehearsal helps by practicing the, the recall of the memory. Um, so with additional repetitions, uh, these neural circuits are being strengthened, reinforced, um, and it makes the recall more efficient for the future. Um, there's also chunking, um, which is the batching um, of different groups of numbers together. Um, so just some examples are, you know, 7841 becomes 78 and 41, or 000, zero, zero becomes triple zero. Um, we know chunking works because, you know, Almost every commercial utilizes it. You hear this all the time. Um, it's a lot easier to remember, you know, 7841 because our brains process this as just two numbers rather than four numbers of 7841. Um, rhymes are very useful as well. Um, so uh, they can help with consolidating names, tasks, uh, many different things. So um, an example for names is, you know, I'm going to pick on uh, Jane from the example <laughs> on the slide before, uh, you know, Jane from Maine or Mark with a teeth like a shark or Denise has geese. Um, you know, it's OK. And actually even better if the rhyme is somewhat, um, you know, uh, you know, fantasy or fiction. Right. Uh, if it's somewhat a little mean or unflattering, humorous, witty, you know, things of this nature, uh, just because the emotion of it, whether it's funny or whatever it might be. Um, deepens memory consolidation because again, just like uh, seeing the face might help us remem remember the the name, uh, the emotion that we associate with it is just another piece of information that um, that's connected to that. Um, so again, the rhyme does not have to be factually correct. Uh, you know, Denise may not own geese, for example. Um, for tasks, uh, an example is you know if trying to remember to take the pills. Um, to be like Edison, take your medicine. Um, if trying to remember to go to the store, you know, I'm on the floor until I go to the store. Um, again, just some examples, find one that works for you. And again, try to see if repetition, uh, combining repetition and rhymes might be a good strategy. Um, and then jingles or musical melodies. Um, you know, again, think of just how useful this might be if, you know, every commercial uses some kind of a jingle or a musical melody. Um, you know, everyone knows the McDonald's jingle, you know, there's a reason it works. Or excuse me, there's a reason it's used so much and it's because it works. Um, I want to talk about schedules, calendars, and planners. Um, so these are meant to assist in organizing your days, um, you know, just so not to overwhelm yourself by having to remember everything. Um, and it might help in uh, creating a, a regular routine. Um, you know, it removes the burden of having to memorize it. Um, and you also have some options, right, between paper and electronic. Uh, some people swear by their, you know, paper calendar uh, that they carry with them or keep at home. Other people swear by their, you know, Google calendar on their phone. Um, 
just some considerations um, as you find what works for you. Again, I'm not one to say, you know, you have to use electronic or you have to use paper. Everybody's different. Um, if using paper, um, you know, use a planner with one page for one day um, and one that has hourly slots. Um, you know, this way there's, um, you know, sometimes there's, you know, a whole week for a page. Um, there can be very small slots where you write something and, um, you know, it can just get cluttered very quickly. Um, write in pencil. That way, if something changes or, you know, your physical therapy appointment gets moved, um, you know, you can just erase it and move it rather than having to, uh, you know, scribble out with ink. And again, it becomes more cluttered and less organized if that's the case. Um, but then also, you know, if using paper, keep one schedule for, uh, for everything, right? Use one calendar for anything, for your medical appointments, uh, for personal appointments, uh, for work meetings, you know, things like that. It can, again, be, um, it can be hard to organize if you have one calendar for work, another calendar for, you know, treatment, um, keeping it consolidated um, keeps it a lot more simple. Um, if you use an electronic calendar, um, some uh, just a tip is you can use Siri or even uh, Google Assistant. Um, I won't say it in case you know this triggers any of your home devices, <laughs> uh, but you could say something like, you know, remind me to buy milk at five thirty today. Um, it'll add it to your calendar right away, and it'll even notify you, um, you know, to once that time comes around, which can be very helpful. Uh, color coding uh, can be a lot easier on electronic um, calendars rather than paper. So, you know, I've had clients that made all of their uh, chemo appointments one color, all of their physical therapy appointments another color. And so that way, just at a glance, you can see exactly what's going on and when. Um, you can also set custom notification times. Um, so let's say you uh, want to, you know, remember that you have an appointment at a certain time and usually it takes let's say half an hour to drive there, um, well, you'll be able to then, um, you know, set a custom notification time where, you know, your phone or your computer will tell you an hour before, don't forget you have an appointment coming up. Um, and just some recommended apps, um, if this is something you wanna explore, Google Calendar is very uh, intuitive to use. Um, Habit Tracker is one, there's many others. Um, some pros of electronic compared to paper. Again, it's easy to color code, add, delete, move things around. Um, it can be shared with others. So if you have a caregiver or a friend, uh, you can give them access to this um, and they can uh, make sure that they're in the loop. Um, you can add notifications, as I mentioned, um, but it can also be synced between uh, your phone, your tablet, smartwatches, even your computer. Uh, so really there's no, there's no escape uh, from whatever you put in. Uh, you know, for better or for worse. Um, some pros of paper over electronic is that it doesn't have to be charged for one. Um, you'll never run out of battery, um, but also no setup or software updates, anything like that. Um, but regardless, one page per day, if you use paper, um, make sure the spaces are big enough um, and that hourly slots help as well, um, just so that it's you can quite literally block out the day uh, with different activities. Um, one thing I want to note is I do recommend avoiding to-do lists, uh, because they fail to provide uh, a visual overview of how much, um, can realistically be completed or accomplished within a specific amount of time. Um, you know, a, a few check boxes, uh, might look like just a few check boxes, but when you, you know, translate that into a calendar, um, and block out how much time you think it will take you'll notice that one of the check boxes might take say three hours if it involves driving and doing something coming back. Um, and another checkbox might take five minutes if it just means getting a call to someone. Um, but you wouldn't be able to tell just by seeing the number of check boxes. Um, so again, that's just my recommendation, but if you find that that works for you, please you know incorporate whatever is useful. Um, so in general, um, I want to finish off just by, um, adding a note about practice, uh, but also self-compassion. So, you know, I understand that 
many of you um, or your loved ones or uh, whoever um, you're here for, um, you know, you may have faced frustration, anger, or resentment, you know, towards uh, your or, you know, a loved one's experiences with chemo brain. Um, alternatively, some of you are anxious about possibly experiencing chemo brain, you know, in the future. Um, as you implement, you know, these techniques, you know, I hope you notice progress and shifts in your chemo brain symptoms. Um, but also, you know, there's a likelihood that just a couple of times of uh, practicing one of these tools, um, you know, isn't enough to notice a huge drastic difference in your chemo brain symptoms. Um, but, you know, I, I hope you can remember that taking care of your, your cognitive and mental health is a continuous process. Um, there will be ebbs and flows in your experiences. Um, and I hope that, you know, I can continue to be a resource for you all as you, you know, begin to implement some of these skills. Um, so just as a recap, you know, we talked about self-monitoring, self-instruction, uh, PMR, rehearsal and chunking, rhymes, schedules, calendars, and planners. Um, again, we talked about that feedback loop, um, which can be a really helpful, you know, uh, lens or paradigm to, to think of the chemo brain experience through. Um, you know, and again, um, I really encourage you to practice these skills. It might not come naturally or easily the first couple of times you do it. Um, but, you know, the more you practice, the more it becomes part of, you know, how you respond to different situations. Um, if you need, you know, an idea of what to practice, um, you can try, you know, memorizing a phone number. Uh, it can be a phone number of your doctor's office. This is Cancer Wellness uh, Center's um, phone number, uh, which is, you know, a good number to memorize as well. Um, you know, just as an example, um, you know, you might use self-instruction as you walk yourself through that process. You might use rhyming or chunking uh, for that phone number. Um, you know, you can also go on a walk uh, or, you know, drive to a new destination. Uh, look up the directions, you know, at home, um, but then leave those directions at home and, um, you know, don't look at, don't look at them while you're walking there and see um, if you can uh, see if you can, uh, you know, arrive at that, at, at that house, you know, in your neighborhood, just as a test. Um, this could be something that can be, you know, pretty interesting to work up to as well. Um, PMR is really good to practice daily. Um, some people like to do it in the beginning of the day as a, you know, to ground themselves for the day. Some people like to do it as a relaxation exercise, you know, in the middle of the day or towards the end of the day. Again, experiment with the different times uh, based on what works for you. Um, and then all of these general skills um, takes time. So, you know, I hope that you can try these. Uh, you can let me know if you have any questions or want any additional materials. Um, I believe I have, yep, I have my uh, email listed here. Um, I'll also be CC'd on, you know, the email you receive following this program. Uh, so no need to write this down. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you think of, you know, in the future, um, or if you need any other resources or information. Um, Lisa, if we can stop the recording. Um, I do have, I do have a couple questions before we stop the recording, just so we can keep them in the, in the space. Can chemo brain come and go? Oh, um, yes. So I think, um, so let me just stop my share just so I can see everyone a little bit better. Um, the question was, can chemo uh, brain video come and go? Like, uh, I'd love to see all the Uh, let me just pull up the chat just so I can see it. Uh, can chemo brain come and go? Um, that is a good question. So um, the way I interpret that question, um, I think, uh, Christian, you you asked this. Um, let's see if we can help people unmute here in a little bit. But my interpretation of that is um, over time or, um, uh, Chris, I can see you. So just by nod or shake, do you mean over time, you know, many days or months or within the day? Um, let's see. Mark, I haven't stopped the recording yet. So I was, if you want me to stop, I'll go ahead and stop and you can have a discussion. I just wasn't sure if you wanted to answer the chat questions first. Oh, sure. Let's stop the recording. That way people can unmute. I think that's easier. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining the recording. Uh,